This video is called Boys Don't Cry, But Men Do. My wish for this video is to allow space for boys and men to be true to themselves, true to their emotions, not second guess and survive, but to be connected with themselves and their feelings and connected with other people. From a very early age, boys are told, don't be a girl, don't be a sissy, boys don't cry. So I hope that parents, teachers, communities make space to listen and allow, allow boys and men to have emotions. I remember my cousin's kid fell over and he really hurt himself and he stood up and he was in shock and he looked at us and he said, I really hurt my knee but I, I didn't cry and I just thought, oh my God, how much is being pushed down? So, yeah, boys don't cry, but men do. When I was a child, I remembered kind of bricking over my emotions because if I cried, then if I lost it, then maybe the whole family would have lost it. We were holding it together. We had a lot to survive. So I bricked over my emotions. Boys don't cry. Have to be safe. Can't be weak. Can't be emotional. Can't be humiliated. Can't be abandoned for being a sissy or a wuss. And if I needed to cry, I'd lock myself in the toilet and that's where I'd cry. And then I couldn't even do that anymore. But I had two secret weapons to get me going. One was the Waltons. Da -da 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 -da. And the Waltons, for some reason, would really, it would touch me and I'd cry. The other one, when I was older, was the Karen Carpenter story. And the Karen Carpenter story would really get me going. And then I bricked over that. I hardened up and I really couldn't cry for a long, long time. I didn't cry for myself. I was the survivor. I kept surviving. So BBC Three asked me in and it was a short documentary about men and emotions, what it's like to be a male in the 21st century, mental health, isolation, suicide, all the kind of stuff that, that I, I talk about and work with. And I thought, yeah, I'll back that. I'll be part of that. And I was questioned by the producer, and she was great, and she was gentle, and she took me to the edge of tears. And it's like my face cracked open and something leaked. And it wasn't a big boo-hoo or anything, it was just open. And then a few months later, I got an email with a link from the producer saying, it's out, it's ready, check this out. I was in a business lounge full of suits um, and I switched it on straight away and I was just so excited. It's like, this is gonna be great. And I watched where I was and I wit witnessed myself and I cried. It was the first time that I ever saw myself emotional and I guess in a way cried for myself. And this was for me. This wasn't for John Boy Walton or Karen Carpenter or this was for me. And I thought, I have to watch this again. I cannot cry every time I watch this. So I nipped to the toilet as I was used to doing, um, came back, switched it on, turned around just in case anyone could see me in this like sooty business lounge and I watched it again and it's like oh not again um, and it wasn't sad it was like touched I was touched um, with emotion something opened up and I felt it and I didn't feel like a little boy that needed saving um, I didn't I didn't feel like a boy this was a man feeling something and allowing it to come up and allowing it to pass. So watching myself was like an opening. It was not just cracking my face open, it was breaking the wall in front of my heart. And I think that was the first time I acknowledged me and my emotions. And I watched it a third, third time and it's like, whoopee, <laughs> I can cope with this. I am not going to be a blubbering mess every time. But from that day, something changed. From that day, um, I could feel more. I can feel more. Recently, um, my fourth Thursday men's group, most of us self-organized to go on the most amazing adventure to Essaouira in Morocco. It was absolutely magnificent.
we were having adventures together we were doing stuff and you know could easily get lost with all these rock the casbah stuff whatever it was outrageous um and then suddenly we got to the airport and it's it, everyone split and there was a part of me that went ah after being so together it was every man for himself and that felt weird um it hurt one of my closest friends who was in this group who went on holiday he was up front somewhere and I was told that he had uh, booked a, a different seat and he had three seats and there was a part of me it's like ah but why didn't he tell me uh, what's what's wrong I felt weird emotions I felt anger and I guess that was a self-protection a self-preservation I wasn't really angry I was protecting my emotions and I thought well I need to go here. What, what's beneath this anger? This is silly. It doesn't make sense. And beneath the anger was, it was a kind of abandonment. It was a kind of betrayal. It, I knew there was something else going on. It didn't make sense. This wasn't adult male behaviour. So I was feeling betrayed. I was feeling abandoned. I was feeling all these ridiculous feelings that grown men don't get about their friends on a plane. And I thought, well, obviously there's been a nerve struck here. It's not about this. My anger, my sat, my my emotions aren't generally about what's going on here and now. It hit a nerve, and I thought, I need to find out what's beneath this. I need to find where this charge is coming from. So I did what I basically tell clients to do all the time is, if there's something going on, it's probably not about what's going on in the present. Take a breath and feel the feeling, and follow the feeling, see where it takes you. I took a deep breath, and I felt my feelings. This was beyond anger. This was beyond anything to hold it together and to have, you know, space between me and my feeling. I got into that feeling and that feeling, as I took the breath, took me straight back. I was in Kampala where one day there was no more school. I didn't see my friends. My, it's almost like my life was over. It was not safe to go to school anymore. It wasn't safe to go to church, to town. It's end of story the end of my school friends my school friends that I really loved in my perfect life and there was no time to grieve it or say goodbye it was there's danger survive so with that whole thing with Africa no more school no more nothing and it was never grieved it was never talked about and the next flash I kept breathing there's more it's like I am feeling things and I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to save myself. I'm not going to take it out on anyone and be angry. I want this. So I kept breathing and I was surprised at what came up next. I remember the first time I cried was when we had a phone call saying, we're going to come and kill you tonight. And that's when we went into hiding. What came up next was my school between refugee camps. I went to St. Dominic's Catholic School primary school in Stone, Staffordshire and it was wonderful. I absolutely loved the kids and I fit in. This, this was between refugee camps and it was the last day in the dinner hall. It was my last lunch and um, I couldn't believe that I cried. I was not a crier. I was a survivor. I was a good boy that held it together and didn't make any trouble. So I felt that and there was no space to, survive, to uh, grieve that either. I survived it and I carried on breathing and I carried on breathing. And the next place it took me to was in Wales where I was in primary school and my closest friends kept leaving. They kept moving to England. Families, whole families of people that I loved to be with, my closest friends, they left and they left. What's wrong with me? What do I keep doing wrong? And none of it was grieved. I held it together. I kept breathing over the days and I held this on the edge of tears. It took me to when my cousins were sent to boarding school when I was in Africa. We, I, I absolutely loved my cousins. And suddenly, gone. I, I must have been three, five. I don't remember very well um, I can I can feel it it this wasn't logical this was this was devastating that was where my spirit first broke the funny thing about my friend and I I could have so had a go or had a drama or punished him or whatever it is the funny thing about us is we act like best friends in the playground 
at about seven years old. And that's what works. And if it wasn't for him in my life, I wouldn't have any space to express that part of me or for that part of me to come alive. So there's a clue in itself. And with this charge, with this, you know, my, my betrayal or whatever, and for me to go straight back there, it's like the pieces of the puzzle come together. And it was up to me to feel my way through it and claim myself back. And my God, I feel so much more whole, so much more emotional, so much more alive. I um, worked with dying people in Calcutta with Mother Teresa. And I remember the first person I took care of was a young boy. This boy hadn't um, pooed, he hadn't shat or pissed for a long, long time. His body was like a barrel. It was hard. There was no, there was no feeling. It was just hard. He was in such pain. He was like beyond crying. He was moaning. His father brought him in and it's like, please do something. And everyone was busy. That was, this was the first person I took care of. Uh, I couldn't, I didn't speak his language. I, I didn't know what he was moaning and groaning about. And it was like panic. And the sisters, the nuns didn't know what, you know, we didn't know what to do. Um, cut a long story short, the boy died. Thank God the boy died. He was in, in real pain. There weren't that many deaths that day. It was the home for the dying spec deaths. It's about giving them the best time, um, a good way out. So I was busy. Um, with those that were on death's door and suddenly we had to do uh, a body run so jumped in the um, Mother Teresa mobile um, and carried all the bodies in and one of the nuns gave me a box just as we were going off and I put the box on top of all the other boxes with the people in it was just a small cardboard box and I opened it and it was a baby and um, that story's always got me. <clears throat> it took stories and things like that to get me. It took the Waltons until I bricked over. It took Karen Carpenter's story until I... And I just kept bricking over and bricking over. But since seeing myself on that BBC Three documentary, um, I'm open. It's like I don't need the stories. It's like I, the man in me is alive and emotional and present and no longer surviving stuff. And I was so scared that once I start, I will never stop crying. I will never stop, you know, I'd be this blub <laughs> for the rest of my life. Uh, I'm not, I'm more here than I've ever been. So the, the object of the exercise with this is a very quick, easy way to retrieve the place of the broken spirit. Follow the feeling and have the courage to go beyond anger, beyond punishment, beyond self-preservation, into sadness, into grief, into where the pause button's down. And take care of that part. Where was the spirit broken? What hasn't been grieved? What part of my inner child has been on hold and abandoned. Thanks for watching. To receive more tips and insights, just click on the links below or follow me on Twitter and Facebook and also go to my website to subscribe to my newsletter.